Welcome, everybody. It's delightful to see you. We have been studying the Ten Commandments. How many enjoyed that? In our last lesson, we studied what we call the Eleventh Commandment. And the Lord Jesus said, I'll give you a new commandment. And that's the Eleventh Commandment. And I think, if you don't mind, we'll take the Twelfth one today. <laughs> and uh, it's not among the Ten. We call it the Ten Commandments of Faith. And uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 19, it says, holding faith. I don't think a lot of people realize that if you have something, if you don't secure it within your person, you can lose it. There are people that did have faith that don't have faith. And, and sometimes they don't know it, you know. The Bible says that Samson uh, wist not that his power, his strength had left him. So he arose and says, as at other times, I will go out. But it wasn't like other times. Uh, he had broken his covenant with the Most High, and he, his, his strength had been diminished because he had lost something from God. So it says holding faith. And, and that means to, to, to really uh, don't let any outside influence destroy what God has put within us. Holding faith with a good conscience. And having put away concerning faith, they have made shipwreck. Now, now, that is a very strong statement in that there were those who were sailing good and made shipwreck. It is possible to have good sailing and make shipwreck. I mean, the Bible says so. And so that's the reason we have to hold on to our faith and, and say we're going to continue to have it. In the Ten Commandments of Faith, I have chosen number one to be, if you don't mind, thou shalt have no other words before me. Uh, God's Word is final. God's Word has authority. God's Word is revealed truth. And the Bible is the only inspired Word from heaven and from God. No other book, such as the Book of Mormon, of the Church of the Latter-day Saints, can be justified nor accepted in equality with the Word of God, the Bible. The Bible, no book such as the Key to the Scriptures, of, uh, of Science and Health by Mary Baker Eddy of the Christian Science Cult can stand before God and say this book is from God also. No other word can stand before God's word or with, with God's word saying that they are equal. Concerning that word, the Bible says, forever, O Lord, thy word is established in heaven. No other book on planet Earth has its contents already established and settled in heaven. What you going to say about it? Amen. Okay. In verse 97 of Psalm 119, it says, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. In verse 105, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and it is a light unto my path. These are the qualities of the word of God, and thou shalt have no other word at all before you. In verse 130 it says, The entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. And so the word of God is our teacher. Thou shalt have no other word before thee. Now just like in the Ten Commandments, when he says, Thou shalt have no other gods before thee, you should have no other word before thee. Uh, God's word has all the truth that you need in it, and God's word is the guiding light in our lives, and therefore we seek under the Word of God, and we remain attached to the Word of God. And all the people said, Amen. number two, thou shalt not place personal revelation before my Word. Now that would need an hour. There's so many people in our land today that will let somebody come and say, oh, I, the Lord's told me something about you. And they put that before the Word of God. Now, now that, that is not the way to handle God's Word. God's people have sometimes been led astray through what we call personal revelation or call personal prophecies for people. Sometimes a, a demon spirit, as an angel of light, makes a person believe that it is God directing his life and they're deceived by it. Now, we could give you a lot of illustrations about that, but we don't have time for them. We want you to accept it. I marvel, in Galatians 1 and 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from, from him that called you under the grace of Christ unto another gospel, that's away from the word, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you, and I would, I would pervert the gospel of Christ. 
But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Accursed. As we said before, so say I again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than we have received, let him be accursed. So he, he says it, he says it doubly. Uh, th there are prophets in the church. I mean, if, if, if Brother Hagin will be here and ministering, and he, he speaks, and we, we, we accept it, and he prophesies, and we accept it, but they come to pass. But if somebody just walks up to you and says, I see this in you, and I see that, and God told me, and God told me that, likely God hadn't said anything. And, and you better check with your pastor or with someone else before you go running off in that direction, or you might find yourself in, in deep trouble. Sometimes those prophets, prophets say, you get up and move, quit your job, and do all these kind of things. You better check them out, because uh, if they're not true, then you're the one that's hurt. We don't want any of God's people hurt. Can you say amen? Uh, number three, thou shalt not covet the material wealth of planet Earth. If you, if you make the wealth of this world to be your chief objective in life, you're going to miss the great things of God because the great things of God are spiritual. The greatest things on the face of this earth are spiritual. Material things are not as great as the spiritual things that God can give unto us. The Bible says that the total wealth on planet Earth, that a fire will consume it, and that this contaminated planet, because of rebellion that has been on this planet for at least 6,000 years, uh, that God will, will change the whole surface of this earth because of that and all that you call treasures will be gone. You, you find that story in 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. How many know that? And as some men count slackness, but God is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish. How many glad for that? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens and the earth shall pass away with a great noise. Elements shall melt with a fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be, shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conversation and godliness? If you know that all that you see around you is going to be dissolved, is going to be destroyed, is going to be gone, why should you give a lot of attention to them? The most important thing that anybody can do is win a lost soul to Jesus. They're immortal. They last forever. They, they go beyond the earth. And, and so being, being so important, we should give a lot of attention. And the most attention should be given to people, to persons, and, and not to those kinds of conditions. He says, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, we look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Our true wealth is in the new heavens and the new earth, not in the old heavens and the old earth. Therefore, we use the material things of this earth. We use them well. We, we build buildings with them. And we, we, we wear it. And we eat it. But we don't worship it. Our worship is with God. And our, our chief place of interest is in getting immortal souls into the kingdom and landing them in glory forever. How I many think that's a good work to do? And, and if we will occupy ourselves with that, then the material wealth of this world will not be our chief motive. We have to have it, but we only have it to use. We don't, we don't have it to keep because when you open your hands in death, it's all gone anyway. Thou should not, number four, thou should not destroy thy brother with idle words. Each of these need an hour, you see. We're so prone to use idle words about brothers and sisters. We're taught from the Word of God that if we destroy another through gossip or lies, that our life will experience a harvest greatly multiplied by sorrow. Now, now you cannot destroy another without being destroyed yourself. And, and if you think you can, you know, you're going to miss it. And if you said, why am I having all this trouble? Why am I having all that trouble? Check yourself and see if you're destroying other people through talking about them. And, and thou shalt not destroy thy brother with idle words. Love thy brother, appreciate him, and let him live and rejoice with him. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 16, it says, Thou shalt not go up and down as a tail-bearer among the people, nor use a telephone, saith the Lord. Oh, that's not in there, but works pretty good anyway. Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor, for... I am Jehovah. Then in Proverbs 16, 22, understanding is a wellspring of life 
unto him that hath it. But the instruction of fools is folly. The heart of the wise teacheth his mouth and addeth learning to his lips. Pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, health to the bones. There is a way that seemeth right unto man. That's a tale bearer. But the end thereof are the ways of death. He thinks it's all right to do it, but he's going to die. He that laboreth, laboreth for himself, for his mouth craveth it at, uh, of him. An ungodly man diggeth evil. He just diggeth up evil. His lips, in his lips there's a burning fire. And a forward man soweth strife, and a whisperer, a whisperer divideth. Chief friends. Isn't that something? A person's around whispering. Do you hear this? Do you hear that? Do you know the latest? Those are the people that destroy. Chief friends. People that love and care for one another. And we, we break that thing and destroy. God wants us not to destroy our neighbor. Can you say amen? Number five. These are the Ten Commandments of faith. Thou shalt not give place to lust. Lust will destroy a person. Lust can destroy a family. Lust can ruin a, co a community, just like Sodom was. The whole area was destroyed because of the one thing. Lust had entered into the whole area. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 19, he says, And the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in. There are so many things that one can lust after, and desire more than he desires God, more than he desires church worship. I want to tell you something. People that say, I stay home and worship God, they're lying. How many love truth? Well, you get it whether you like it or not, you know. If you love God, you'd be in the house of God. You just think you love God, and the devil has deceived you, because in the house of God, you have fellowship. And fellowship brings strength. I get strength in fellowship. I'm buoyed up and strengthened through fellowship with God's people. And we all are. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. You don't stay home. You're together. And, and, and together is our strength. But he says, these are the things that choke the Word of God within us, the cares of this world. Some people forever are worrying about what's going to happen to the world. Well, honey, it's been happening 6,000 years. Leave it alone. It'll be all right. I believe that God's got everything in, in, in hand. Yeah, he, he's holding on to everything. The deceitfulness of riches. So many people think, if I get a better job, if I get a better house, if I make more money, I'm going to be happy. But it don't do a thing for you. It'll make you worse, maybe. You see? Uh, it says the deceitfulness of riches. If you use them like God wants you to use them, they're beautiful. But if you use them like lustful people want to use them, then they're not beautiful at all. And then he says, and the lust of other things, they, they choke the word of God and they become, and you become unfruitful before the Lord. In Ephesians 5, 40, 5, 22, it says it this way, that ye put off concerning your former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the de deceitful lust. Every lust of human people is a deceiving thing that you think you're going to, you lust after it, and you think it's going to bring you gratification, you think it's going to bring you fulfillment, and you get it, and it doesn't. And it doesn't work. There's only one thing that really fulfills every total human, and that's God. God can fulfill. God can give you fullness until you're absolutely pleased with yourself, and you're happy with yourself, because God gives it to you. But, 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 if you think that other things are going to give you total fulfillment, you'll get them, and you won't be happy no matter what it is. In 1 Timothy 6 and 9, it says, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish, hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. So it's how it's handled and not what is handled. In 2 Timothy 2, 22, it says, Flee youthful lusts, follow righteousness and faith and love and peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And so we must watch our lives in that we do not give place to lust, uh, whether it's a physical thing or moral thing, whatever it might be. Number six it says, thou shalt not fear. There are millions of people that are very fearful. We met a pastor's wife this week that will not go into an airplane. She can't go to, she can't go to Jerusalem. 
You have to have an airplane to go. So she can't, she just, she won't go. You can buy her a ticket, but she won't go. She, she, she doesn't want to go to California unless she can drive for four days. Uh, you know, she, she, just, uh, she just decided that, that she's afraid. Now, now the, the strange thing about fear is it grows like a wild weed. This week you'll be fearful about one thing. This week you'll be fearful about something else. The devil never quits, you know. And, and so you don't let fear take hold of you. When the devil tells me in that room, in that room is a booger bear, and he'll get you, I don't, I don't just open the door. I knock it down. I take my foot and knock it down, you see. And, and then I walk in. I said, you're a liar. And you see that you're a liar, and I prove that you're a liar. See there? All the boogaboos of the devil are lies. And if you're going to believe them, they'll keep you from happiness and peace and security. But in Jesus, we trust. And when we trust in him, then we, we don't have to be afraid. If you know it, say amen. That's right. In 1 John 4, 18, it says, there is no fear in love. Now, that is one of the great verses of the whole Bible. Uh, that is in 1 John 4, 18, that, that there's no fear. When you have perfect love, you don't have any fear. There can't, there can't be any fear. In perfect love, there's no fear. So if there's any spot within you where you're afraid, and that little spot, Jesus is not there. And so in order to get Jesus in your total life, you eradicate fear. You're not afraid to live. You're not afraid to die. You're not afraid to go forward. You're not afraid to go anyway because God is with you. He says, fear has torment. This is still 1 John 4, 18. Fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So a person that has fear, they're sure God not perfect. The Bible says so. They're not perfect. So the thing to do, if the devil is trying to put a fear in you, knock it out. Do the thing, do the thing that he tells you you can't do in Jesus' name. And all the people said, all right. So there are just millions of people today living who are oppressed. Most of the heathen are oppressed by fear. When you live, live with the heathen, they, they, they're afraid of the night. They, they're afraid of demons. They, they're afraid of unseen uh, enemies. They, they, they're totally shaken with fear, you see, they, they, uh, of fear. But God's people, God is light and God is love and there's no fear in God. And when you get into God, there is no fear. There's no fear. And God can set you free from fear. And when it says that fear hath torment, that's exactly what I have found everywhere in the world, that, that fear does have torment. And, and I don't want to be tormented. How about you? In this, in this service today, you can get liberated from fear if you have fear. All right. Number seven, the Ten, and the ten Commandments of Faith. If you're going to have faith, you have to live up to these commandments. Number seven says, Thou shalt not confess human frailty. Some people, every moment of their life, they're confessing a human frailty, a human problem. Uh, I, I tried to get close to a minister this week that he didn't realize it because he, he feels he's charismatic. Uh, that that uh, Every time he spoke, he said, this one's against me, that one's against me, <laughs> the other one's against me. And uh, if inside you're just kind of, you know, wondered if he was trying to build himself up that he was worth being against, you see. And uh, really, there's nobody against you. Are you here or not? I preached for the businessmen in Chicago, not the full gospel businessmen, the, the businessmen's committee in Chicago. Uh, and at that time, they had a radio broadcast every day on WJJD, a 50,000-watt station. And I'd been there for a week teaching every day on, on, the, on, the, on the radio. And I saw a little woman, little, 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 little. and uh, she was kind of creeping and looking both ways. And I, I said, come here, honey. Lord bless you. And, and she didn't answer me back. She says, they're after me. I said, well, who's after you? She didn't look like she's worth 50 cents total, top bottom, you know. And I said, who's after you? She said, all those men are. She pointed, you know who they were? They were the millionaire Christians of Chicago. And Dr. Oswald J. Smith was visiting there, and she pointed at him. And he'd just gotten in town by plane and, and he, from Toronto. And so I said, which ones are after you? Point them out to me quick. And she began to point out these men that were that were great businessmen putting hundreds of thousands of dollars under the gospel, and, and they were her enemies. I said, what are they going to do to you? She says, they're going to get me. I said, they are. I didn't want to tell her that if anybody found her, they'd put her in the garbage, 
you know, in fact, that's where she belonged, in the garbage pail somewhere. And I moved over closer to her, and I said, those men are not going to hurt you. Oh, yes, they're after me. And I said, let, let me help you, will you? Oh, she says, no, you want me to. Oh, I said, that's a new wrinkle, you know. And she ran down one of those busy streets right in the heart of Chicago, looking both ways, looking all around to see who was after her. I didn't know as much about fear those days as I do today. But there's a poor little creature. I don't know her background. Her background might have been beautiful somewhere. But somehow the devil put fear in her heart. And she began to fear the men that if she had walked up to them and said, I need rent for a month, they'd reach right in their pocket and hand it to her and say, hi, honey, we'd be glad to do that for you. Or she'd need a new dress, they'd have said, yeah, buy you a pretty one. Here's the money. They possibly had never noticed her yet, had never even seen her yet, you know. She sat toward the back scene that nobody would get her. And, and her life was destroyed with fear, destroyed by fear. Now, fear is unreasonable. With your fears, they're unreasonable. They don't have any reason among them. They don't even need a cause. There's no cause behind them. If it was, we'd all be afraid of the same thing, you know, but it isn't true. So when fear tries to strike you, destroy fear in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? And don't talk about your, your frailties. In Joel 3 and 10, it says, Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears, and let the weak say, I am strong. Let the weak say, I am strong. It is so easy to confess your weakness, just confessing your weakness all the time. I've, I've had people that say, why don't you tell us all the things you fail in? Well, I said, honey, those are so obvious. I don't need to talk about those. I better talk about the things God's done for me and hope you can see it. Are you here? In Psalm 27, 1, it says, The Lord is my light, and the Lord is my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength, is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You see. I don't think God wants you going around confessing your sicknesses and, and your, your frailties and your, and your mistakes. Don't make them anymore and forget the ones you did make. And, and start a new life every morning. Look in the mirror and say, hey, you're going to look better tomorrow morning, and I don't mean maybe. And work on it all day. God doesn't want us to go around making negative confessions. Negative confessions never bless you or anybody else. They don't bless anybody. And so there's no reason at all for making negative confessions. Nor shall we confess our inferiority. Philippians 4, 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All things through Christ who strengthens me. Therefore, we must not go around confessing inferiority to anybody or anything. We are what God made us. We're going to be what God wants us to be. We're going to go where God wants us to go. If you know it, say amen. amen. Number eight, thou shalt not confess sickness. Every time some people have a pimple, they call it cancer. <laughs> They're so hopeful that they can get something that people pay attention to them for. Matthew 8 and 17, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sickness. That's what we want to tell people. That's what we want to tell ourselves. We don't confess sickness. We confess that Jesus took our infirmities and that Jesus took our sickness away. Can you say amen? Back in Isaiah chapter 53 and 5, it says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Yeah, with his stripes we're healed. In Exodus 15, 26, and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, and, and thou shalt do that which is right in his sight, and shall not give ear to the, and shall give ear to his commandments, and keep all of his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am Jehovah Rapha. I am Jehovah that healeth thee. I am Jehovah Rapha. I am the God. God. I am the healing God. I am the healing God. <laughs> Some people had asked me if the devil can heal. I said, well, that's not his normal business. He gets people sick, but you know, it's not his normal. But if you talk about God, yeah, that's part of his nature to heal. That's part of what he is, to heal. If you're sick, part of his nature is to heal that thing. How many are glad for that? Yeah, you're in a good place to get your healing today. Thou shalt not confess sickness. Number nine, thou shalt not confess anxiety. In Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing. 
in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be known unto God and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus we don't have to confess anxieties what's going to happen what's going to happen nothing yeah, just like the past all we're going to do is love Jesus and serve Jesus and go to heaven can you say amen First Peter 5 and 7 says, casting all your care upon him because he cared for you. We don't confess anxieties. We're not worried about the future. You say, what's going to happen? I don't care what happens. I'm going to keep my hands in the hands of Jesus, and I'm going to march through it because all that God wants to come to pass will come to pass, and that's all that's going to come to pass. Number 10, thou shalt not confess poverty. And you have your scriptures there. Read them. Philippians 4 and 19, my God shall supply all your needs. Psalm 23, 1, the Lord, Jehovah, is my shepherd. Uh, 3 John 2, beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health as thy soul prospereth. David said in Psalm 37, 25, once I was young, now I am old. I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their seed begging bread. I tell you, we must not confess poverty. Poverty belongs to the devil. He's poor, and he's a thief, and everything he's got, he stole it. Someday we're going to put him in jail in the bottomless pit, never let him out. Life sentence for eternity. And, and so we don't, make, we don't make confessions that we don't have anything. We make confessions that we do have them. And, and we do have them. And because of our confession, we bring into being that which is not. That which is not, we make it appear. God spoke the worlds into existence and he can speak prosperity into your life. And we believe it. Glory be to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. 